Well, good morning, Walden Community Church. It's so good to have you both here in the sanctuary and for those of you who are watching online. Today is our last Sunday covering the story of Joseph. This is our last Sunday in Joseph. Next week, we'll be having our patriotic celebration uh, because it'll have just been July 4th, and so we're going to sing some patriotic songs. We'll have the sanctuary decorated for the holiday, and we hope to see you in attendance. We're going to pick up in Genesis chapter 43. It says, Now the famine was severe in the land, and when they had eaten the grain that they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, Go again and buy us a little food. Joseph's brothers came home with food, they shared it with their family, and they've now run out of food. And dad says, go back and get more food. And my question is, has everyone just forgotten about Simeon, <laughs> who is still rotting away back in an Egyptian jail? He was left there as leverage so that the brothers would come back. Why have they not rushed back to get Simeon out of jail? Well, first, because there is no rushing back. Uh, to get to Egypt, if you were walking, let's say, six hours a day, it would take you a little under three weeks to get there from Canaan to Egypt. But just the fact that they wait until they've completely run out of food before they decide to go back and get him. The other reason is the next thing that they say. Their father said to them, go again, buy us a little food. But Judah said to him, the man, this would be, Saul, this would be Joseph, solemnly warned us saying, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you will send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. So now we have this second trip to Egypt, and we've got a couple of goals. Uh, number one, prove that they're not spies, right? Uh, number two, buy more food. And three, get Simeon out of prison. The first trip was a casual trip, just like going to the store. We're going to buy some grain. Probably didn't think anything of it. Happy to get out of the house. It's a brother's road trip. The second trip to Egypt sounds more like the movie plot to Mission Impossible. Now we're nervous. Now we're scared. And how is Simeon anyway? I mean, will the Egyptian leader even keep his word? We don't know. Verse 6, Israel says, Why did you treat me so badly as to tell me the man that you had another brother? They replied, the man questioned us carefully about ourselves and our kindred, saying, Is your father still alive? Do you have another brother? What we told him was an answer to these questions. Could we in any way know that he would say, Bring your brother down? And Judah said to Israel his father, Send the boy with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I will be a pledge of his safety. From my hand, you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. If we had not delayed, we would now have returned twice. Judah gives a very stirring speech here, and he's making a very mature promise. Judah says, I will be responsible, right? And, and, and this is really the first growth, the first milestone that we see from any of the brothers. We have a brother that's taking responsibility. And he's taking responsibility for his actions and saying he's going to take responsibility for his little brother. And this is really a sign of growth for him. This is really a sign of maturing. Judah's speech is going to earn him the respect of his father and it's going to allow Benjamin to go on the trip with them. And just as a side fact, Jesus is the descendant of which one of these brothers? Twelve sons, right? Twelve tribes of Israel. Which tribe does Jesus come from? Judah. 
Verse 11. Then their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choice fruits of the land in your bags and carry a present down to the man, a little balm and a little honey, gum, myrrh, pistachio nuts, and almonds. If Jacob has had these items the entire time during the famine, they would have been very expensive. I mean, first of all, because they just wouldn't have been as common in Egypt. Maybe a little bit more common in Canaan, but not Egypt. But then to also have them during a famine, when people don't have food, it's like Jacob saying, hey, and you're going to bring this entire semi-truck of toilet paper with you. It's very rare, very costly items. Verse 12, take double the money with you, carry back with you the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks, and perhaps it was an oversight. Remember last week, uh, Joseph sent their money back with them, but Jacob and his sons, they still have all of it. Plus, they have a little more. Jacob's decided nobody is going to buy his meal. We see here a man of integrity in Jacob. We see here a man of honesty. You know, last week I said that a person with a soft heart places people and relationships above things. Joseph gave them all the food that they asked for, gave them all their money back, and he didn't have to. Now we see that Joseph's dad understands that even during a famine, even if Egypt holds all the cards, they hold all the food, all the wealth, all the money, it's not a reason to hate them. And it's not a reason to deal shrewdly with them. Jacob still acts with honesty. Jacob still acts with integrity. Verse 13. Take also your brother and arise, go again to the man. May God Almighty grant you mercy before the man. And may he send back your brother Benjamin. And as for me, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. So the men took this present, and they took double the money with them. And Benjamin, they arose and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, Bring the men into the house, and slaughter an animal, and make ready, for the men are to dine with me at noon. So the quest uh, begins. Nine men who feel guilty about what they did to their brother Joseph. And they also have one brother in jail. He's in an Egyptian prison. They're all heading back to Egypt along with their youngest brother, Benjamin. Now, the Bible wastes no time in telling the story, and it has them immediately standing before Joseph in a single sentence. And Joseph, who has not seen his baby brother in 20 years, and he's seeing him now for the first time, and it's like a stranger would be standing before him. But rather than immediately honor their earlier agreement and just say, okay then, he invites them to this big elaborate meal. Can you imagine what Joseph's house servants would have thought? Uh, we're doing what? We're preparing a meal for who? Verse 17. The men did as Joseph told them and brought the men into the Joseph's house. And the men were afraid because they were brought to Joseph's house. And they said, it is because of the money which was replaced in our sacks the first time that we are brought in so that he may assault us and fall upon us and make us servants and seize our donkeys. So they went up to the steward of Joseph's house and spoke with him at the door of the house and said, oh my Lord, we came down the first time to buy food and when we came to the lodging place and opened our sacks, there was each man's money in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. So we have brought it again with us, and we have brought other money down with us to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. He replied, Peace to you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has put treasure in your sacks for you. I received your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. And when the man had been brought, the men into Joseph's house and given them water, and they had washed their feet 
And when he had given their donkeys fodder, they prepared the present for Joseph coming at noon, for they heard that they should eat bread there. You know, in King Henry VI, William Shakespeare said, suspicion always haunts the guilty mind. And I'm sure that these brothers were already afraid of this confrontation, but now being treated this way, even though they're being treated well, treated kindly, that made it worrisome. The brothers quickly try to figure out what's going on. And they try to prove their innocence by talking to one of Joseph's employees. But it only gets more elaborate. They get their feet washed. Their pack animals are fed. And they sit down to a luxurious meal. Verse 26, when Joseph came home, they brought into the house to him the present that they had with them and bowed down to him to the ground. And he inquired about their welfare and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? They said, Your servant, our father, is well. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads and prostrated themselves. So we have Joseph now show up to dinner, and I'm sure all of the brothers are watching his expression, right? Watching his attitude, watching his demeanor. Is he angry? But Joseph is not angry. He's not mean. In fact, he asks them questions about themselves, uh, about their dad, takes an interest in them. Verse 29, And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? God be gracious to you, my son. There he is. The only real other brother that he's ever had. They have the same mom, same dad, Benjamin. He's the only connection that he has to his mother, Rachel. And there he sits. And Benjamin doesn't even know that he's in the room. Verse 30, Then Joseph hurried out, for his compassion grew warm for his brother, and he sought a place to weep. And he entered his chamber and wept there, Then he washed his face and came out, and controlling himself, he said, serve the food. You know, we've been saying for a couple of weeks now, God is always at work. God is always at work. Joseph is emotional. He's seeing his brother again, and for sure, he's excited. He's excited to reintroduce himself, to have a relationship, not just with Benjamin, but with all of these men again. Have you ever been so moved? Have you ever been so moved to emotion when you see God's hand? You know, we say God is at work, but when you are able to, in a moment, just see how God lined everything up, that you are able to see what God can do with your own eyes, this meal that they're sharing together, it's all of the puzzle pieces coming together in Joseph's life. Joseph knew He knew as a young boy, one day he'd be able to provide for his family. And seeing Benjamin after all these years is an answer to that prayer. It's the answer to all those questions. He's okay. Your little brother Benjamin, he's okay. Joseph is overtaken with emotion. He runs out of the room to control himself. We've all been there. You know, we've looked at our life. We've looked at the doubts we've had. We've looked at and wondered and questioned, what is God doing? What is God doing in my life? What's God doing behind the scenes? What, what is God thinking? And we've seen our life take these giant detours, go off on these roads, these paths that we never thought that we'd take or that we should take. Didn't even dream that we would have taken only to find yourself out on a walk or in prayer or just falling down face first into your bed, crying, wailing out to God, just like we see Joseph doing here. You know, we've been saying through this entire series with Joseph, these are real people. This is a real family. This is a real hurting and a real fractured family. And just like real people, 
we see them make mistakes. We see the walls that they build with one another. And we also see the emotion that spills out of them when those walls come down. But Joseph is able to wipe his eyes, gain a little composure, head back out and say, all right, who's hungry? Let's eat. Verse 32. They served him by himself and them by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. Yes, yes. This is an example of segregation, class racism in the Bible, which was not uncommon. The Egyptians were a ruling class and they considered themselves more intelligent, more sophisticated than the Jews, who were just simple, gypsy-like people. They were shepherds. Verse 33, and they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked at one another in amazement. Portions were taken to them from Joseph's table, but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs. And they drank and were merry with him. Here we see the men sit down to a feast of all kinds of fanciful food. T-bone steak, Brookshire Brothers fried chicken, potato salad, cornbread, cheesecake, pumpkin pie, broccoli cheese crouton casserole, coleslaw, and a nice tall glass of sweet tea. But Benjamin, his plate, has five times more food on it. I mean, look at him. He's just skin and bones. Can you put some more, put, no, put more food, more food on him. Eat, eat, son, eat. These guys come to Egypt and they're afraid, right? They're afraid of what's going to happen. And instead, they get the red carpet rolled out for them. These men deserved something different. They deserve to get punished for what they did to Joseph. These men deserved revenge. They deserved retaliation. And instead, they get grace upon grace upon grace. They get blessing on top of blessing. You know this scene, sitting around the king's table, it reminds me of another table that we see far into the future. The prophet Isaiah says, on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. Jesus says in Luke chapter 22, and I assign to you as my Father assigned to me a kingdom, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Joseph is the one who prepares a great feast for the least of these. People who do not deserve forgiveness. People who do not deserve grace. And Jesus is the one who prepares a banquet table in heaven for a great multitude that Revelation 7-9 says that no one could number from every nation, every tribe, every people and every language. Jesus even created, remember, a little mini preview of this, of what that would look like when he sat down with 12 disciples seated at a meal. Luke 22 says, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. How strange this must have looked to the 12 disciples who eat that meal with Jesus to look around that evening and remember their Bible stories. The disciples and the brothers who both had their feet washed before the meal. 12 men sit down to eat, each one 
a child of Israel, each one a disciple of God, and now with Jesus. Why 12 disciples? Well, each one represents one of the brothers. Each one represents the 12 tribes, the 12 tribes of Jacob, of Israel. And the host of the meal, Joseph. Joseph's name means God will increase. Meaning whatever we see Joseph do, whatever languish, extravagant, unmerited favor that we see Joseph give, the host of our dinner, our Savior, Jesus, he will bring even more. Joseph forgives mistreatment. He demonstrates grace. He holds no record of wrong, and he prepares a banquet for those in his family. Genesis 44 says, Then he commanded the steward of the house, Fill these men's sacks with food as much as they can carry, and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack, and put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest, with his money for the grain. And he did as Joseph told him. As soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away with their donkeys. They had gone only a short distance from the city. Now Joseph said to his steward, Up, follow after these men. And when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Is it not that this is the cup my Lord drinks? And by this, that he practices divination, you have done an evil thing in doing this. And the silver cup was a symbol of Joseph's authority. And again, Joseph is tricking them. And he's creating uh, another excuse to keep them near him, to keep them in his life. Verse 6 one says, when he overtook them, he spoke to them these words. They said to him, why does my Lord speak such words as these? Far be it from your servants to do a thing. Behold, the money that was found in the mouths of our sacks we brought back to you from the land of Canaan. How then could we steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? Whichever of your servants is found with it shall die, and we also will be my Lord's servants. He said, let it be as you say. He who is found with it shall be my servant, and the rest of you shall be innocent. Then each man quickly lowered his sack to the ground, and each man opened his sack. And he searched, beginning with the eldest and ending with the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. And then they tore their clothes, and every man loaded his donkey, and they returned to the city. To tear your garment, to rend your garment, that was a physical, symbolic way of showing your heart. And it was also showing, saying, my heart is torn in two. My, t- my heart is torn. It's a way of saying that you were deeply sad. When Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, he was still there, and they fell before him to the ground. And Judah said, What shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also, in whose hand the cup has been found. But he said, Far be it from me that I should do so. Only the man in whose hand the cup was found shall be my servant. But as for you, go up in peace to your father. Now remember, Judah promised. Judah made a promise to his father that no harm would come to Benjamin and that he would take all the responsibility. And watch what happens. Then Judah went up to him and said, O my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's ear and let not your anger burn against your servant for you are like Pharaoh himself. My Lord asked his servants, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a young brother, the child of his old age. His brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me, so that I may set eyes on him. We said to my Lord, The boy cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. Then you said to your servants, unless your youngest brother comes down to you, you shall not see my face again. For your servant became a pledge of safety to the boy, to my father, saying, if I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father all my life. Now therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord, and let the boy go back with his brothers. For how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see the evil that would find my father. What a change. 
we see in Judah. What a transformation has taken place in this brother. This man who once sinned so greatly as to sell his brother into slavery, he's now willing to become a slave. He's now willing to become a slave to save the innocent. Okay, we've looked at the story. We're almost to the end. Let's take a couple steps back and just examine this for a moment because this story is our story. The story of Joseph is our story. And it's about how God deals with us, about what we deserve, and about how God treats us. Why does Joseph manipulate his brothers like this? Because God controls the circumstances to bring the sinner to himself. And this is what we've been saying. God is at work, right? God is at work. Too often we get full of ourselves down here and we think we're in control or we think that we know it all. We can pay some hefty fee, bring our own lavish offering or talk our way out of things. But the truth is, it's really God. God is in control. God is in control and he brings us to him, which leads Judah to take ownership of his past. And he confesses his sins. The lost sinner stands before God's throne. And the scary thing for Judah is, he thinks this is the end. Right now, he doesn't confess to clear his conscience. He doesn't confess to get himself out of a jam. His confession is purely selfless. His confession is honest. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. And I'm sure this is what Judah is expecting. But just like we read last week, Proverbs 28.13, Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Number three, our judge is also our savior. Genesis 45, then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers and he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. Joseph stands before them. And Judah thinks this is my judge, right? He thinks Joseph is his judge. And he's not knowing this whole time that his savior lives. Just let that sink in, right? And because he lives, he is able to save. Wow, right? Was it the brother's gifts that saved them? No. Was it the fact that they brought Benjamin back with them? No. Was it Judah's stirring speech? No. It's not by works. It's not by anything that we do. Joseph saved because he had the power. Joseph saved because he could. Joseph saved because he loved first. He first loved his family. Ephesians 2.19 says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So many of us, we are just as guilty. We are just as guilty as Joseph's brothers, and we fear that God will never love us God will never forgive us for our sins, for our past mistakes. But God is more than a judge. God is also our savior. He doesn't blame us. He doesn't condemn us. Instead, he offers us freedom and forgiveness and a seat at the great banquet table. And you know, 
when you and I have this great gospel message, we think that the outside world doesn't want it. We think the outside world doesn't care. But you know, when asked, 62% of American adults say they need more forgiveness in their lives. 94% asked when surveyed, they would love to see more forgiveness in their country. In fact, Americans express a near universal desire for a more loving and a more unified world. How do we do that? How do we make that happen? We start by learning to be instruments of forgiveness. T.D. Jake says, I think it is important that we rebuild an atmosphere of forgiveness and civility in every aspect of our lives. Rick Warren said, when you've experienced grace and you feel like you've been forgiven, you're a lot more forgiving of other people. You're a lot more gracious to others. Do you know where change starts? Change starts here. Change starts with us. The story of Joseph is a story of a broken family. It's a real family and it's a story of betrayal and loss and heartache, but it's also a story about redemption and grace. But most of all, it's a story of forgiveness. 62% of Americans say they need more forgiveness in their lives. 94% said they want to see more forgiveness in the United States. And it starts right here. It starts right here in the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus forgave the woman caught in adultery. Jesus forgave the man lowered through the ceiling. Jesus forgave Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Jesus taught stories about debt and forgiveness. Jesus forgave Peter for denying him at his trial. Jesus forgave the people that nailed him to the cross. When asked, how often should I forgive my neighbor? In Matthew 18, 22, Jesus said 70 times seven, which was Jesus's way of saying, don't keep count. Don't keep track. Forgive until you lose count. It's like Jesus had a coin and he would flip it and the outcome would determine what action he would take. And one side of Jesus' coin said love and the other side said forgive. And those were the only two options. Let's remember who we follow. Let's remember who we're named after, whose title we take as Christians. Let's remember that we are all brothers and sisters who sit undeservedly at the great banquet table. None of us deserve to be there. I forgive you. You forgive me. Now please pass the Brookshire Brothers fried chicken and coleslaw, right? The, the church of Jesus has exactly what the world wants. It has exactly what the world needs. Let's stop casting blame. Let's stop taking revenge. Let's stop plotting, deceiving, manipulating, controlling. Let's stop pointing fingers. Let's stop worrying. Let's stop worrying. God is at work. God is in control. Jesus said in Mark 11, and whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you. Paul says to the Ephesians church, be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And in the upper room at Pentecost, 
when Jesus began to form the very first church and he gave them their marching orders. He says in John 20, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. We don't need to control the world. We don't need to lead the world. We don't need to run the world. We don't even need to save the world. God has all of that under control. We can stop worrying because he's always in control. God is always working and he's perfect. Remember, God is always at work and he's perfect. Our job is to show love. Our job is to show grace upon grace. And our job is to extend forgiveness. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this series on Joseph and for what we have seen and learned from it. It's refreshing to know that Joseph came from a real family of real people, a family of brokenness, a family that didn't communicate, a family that plotted and manipulated one another, just like a real family. It's refreshing to see that not all Bible heroes are perfect, because I am not perfect. And you invite me to sit at the table in heaven? I do not deserve it. I am happy to be on the floor picking up the scraps that fall. I am happy to be over in a corner and just to watch those who eat. I am happy just to linger inside the doorway and fantasize about what it would be like to sit next to you. But yet you save the best seat for me. You pull my seat out. You wash my feet and you anoint my head with oil and you bring me the best food and my cup runneth over. This grace that has been shown to me, this forgiveness that has been shown to me, Lord, may it not be forgotten in my heart or in my life. May I be tenderhearted towards my brother and sister. May I learn to forgive and to love the way your son taught and modeled. If I want to change the world, it starts with me. It starts by following the teachings that your son laid out. You have asked me to love God and to love others, to be a minister in this world, to show grace and love and forgiveness. And may that be my responsibility every day. Thank you so much. Amen. Hank, thanks for sitting with us through these six weeks of Joseph. I hope um, it's been just as eye-opening for you as it has been for me. I've had multiple people come up to me and say, wow, that was just great. It's so crazy how that lesson lined up with what's going on in the world. It's just amazing. And I was talking about it with Joanna and, I, and we both said, we, we've got to stop saying that. We've got to stop saying that it's amazing when lessons line up with real life or that when we just read something in scripture, it applies directly to what we're thinking or what we're going through. We've got to stop being amazed that that happens or we need to start expecting it. We got to expect it because God is at work. God is at work in our lives. And when we see it, it should cause us to rejoice and to realize I am on the right track. I'm doing the right thing. When we're out there and you see God's hand moving, when you see God show up, don't be amazed, expect it. Friends, I want you to expect God's presence. I want you to expect God's love. I want you to expect to see God's hand at work every single day. I want you to wake up and just make that your prayer. God, I expect to see your hand move. I expect to see love extended. I expect to see grace given. I expect to see forgiveness. It should be part of our expectation daily, every day. That's what it means 
to be a Christian. I pray that you go out and that you be those things in your community. I love you guys. I'll see you next week.